Chapter 18 Curdie's Clue Curdie was as watchful as ever, but was almost getting tired of his ill success. Every night, or so, he would follow the goblins about as they went digging and boring, getting as near to them as he could, watching from behind the stones and rocks, and yet he was no nearer to finding out what they had in view. As at first, he always kept hold of the string, while his pickaxe, left just outside the hole by which he entered the goblin's country from the mine, continued to serve as an anchor and hold fast at the other end. The goblins, hearing no noise from this quarter, had ceased to apprehend an imminent invasion and kept no watch. One night, after Curdy had dodged about and listened till he was nearly falling asleep from weariness, he began to roll up his ball, for he had resolved to go home to bed. It was not long, however, before he began to feel quite bewildered. One after another, he passed the goblin houses, caves, that is, where the goblin families lived, and at length there were many more than he had passed when he came. He had a great he had to use great caution to pass by unseen, for they lay very close together. Could his string have let him wrong? He still followed winding it, and still it led him to more thickly populated quarters, until he became quite uneasy and, indeed, apprehensive, for although he was not afraid of the cobs, he was afraid of not finding his way out. But what could he do? It was no use to sit down and wait till morning. The morning made no difference here. It was dark, and always dark. And if his string had failed him, he was helpless. He might even arrive within a yard of the mine and never know it. Seeing as he had nothing better to do, he could at least find out where the end of his string was, and if possible, how it had come to play him such a, tri a trick. He knew by the size of the ball he was getting pretty near the end of it, when he began to feel a tugging and a pulling at it. What could it mean? Turning a sharp corner, he thought he heard strange sounds. They grew as he went on into scufflings and snufflings and growlings and squeaks, and the noise increased until, turning a second sharp corner, he found himself in the midst of it, and at the same moment tumbled over a wallowing mass which he knew to be a knot of the cob's creatures. Before he could recover his feet, he had caught some great scratches on his face and several bites on his arms and legs, but as he scrambled to get up, his hand fell on his pickaxe. And before the horrid beasts could do any serious harm to him, he was laying about them right and left in the dark. The hideous creatures gave him the, satis the hideous howls gave him satisfaction of knowing that he had punished them pretty smartly for their rudeness, and by their scampering and retreating howls, he perceived he had routed them. He stood for a little weighing his battle axe as in his hands as if it had been the most precious lump of metal. Indeed, no lump of gold itself could have been more precious at that time than this common tool, and then untied the end of the string from it and put the ball in his pocket, and still stood there thinking. It was clear the cob's creatures had found the axe and carried it off with them, and so had led him he knew not where. But for all his thinking, he could not tell what he ought to do, until suddenly he was aware of a glimmer of light in the distance. Without a moment's hesitation, he set out for it as fast as the unknown and rugged way would permit. Yet again turning a corner, led by the dim light, he spied something quite new in his experience of the underground regions. A small, irregular shape of something shining. Going up to it, he found it was a piece of mica, or muscovy glass, called sheep silver in Scotland, and in the light was flickering from a fire behind it. After trying in vain for some time to discover the entrance to the place where it was burning, he at length found a chamber which had a small opening, high in the ball, which revealed the glow beyond. To this opening he managed to scramble up, and then he saw a strange sight. Below sat a little group of goblins around the fire, the smoke of which vanished into the darkness aloft. The side of the cave was full of shining minerals, like those of the palace hall, and the company were evidently of a superior order, 
for every one of them wore stones about the head or arms or waist, shining with dull, gorgeous colours in the light of the fire. Nor had Curdie been looking very long before he recognised the king himself and found that he had made his way into the inner apartments of the royal family. He had never had such a good chance of hearing something. He crept through the hole as softly as he could and scrambled a good way down the wall towards, out towards them without attracting attention. And he sat down to listen. The king, evidently the queen, and probably the crown prince and prime minister were talking together. He was sure she was the queen because she wore shoes and she was warming her feet by the fire so he could see them quite plainly. That will be fun, said the one he took to be the crown prince. It was the first whole sentence he had heard. I don't know why you should think it to be such a grand affair, said his stepmother, tossing back her head. You must remember my spouse, interposed the king, as if making excuses for his son. He has got the same blood in him, his mother. Don't talk to me about his mother. You positively encourage his unnatural fantasies. Whatever belonged to that mother ought to have been cut out of him. You forget yourself, my dear. I do not, said the queen, and neither nor you. If you expect me to approve of such coarse tastes, you will find yourself most mistaken. I do not wear shoes for nothing. You must acknowledge, however, said the king with a little groan, that this at least is no whim of hair lips, but a matter of state policy. You are well aware that his gratisfaction comes purely from the pleasure of having sacrificed himself for the public good, doesn't it, Harelip? Yes, father, it does. Only it will be nice to make her cry. I'll have the skin taken off from between her toes and tie them up so they grow together. Then her feet will be quite like other people's and there will be no occasion for her to wear shoes. Do you mean to insinuate I have got toes, you unnatural wretch? cried the queen, and she moved angrily towards Harelip. The councillor, however, was betwixt them, and leaned forward so as to prevent her touching him, but as if only to address the prince. Your Royal Highness, he said, possibly requires to be reminded that you yourself have got three toes. One on one foot, two on the other. Ha! 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 So shouted the queen triumphantly. The councillor, encouraged by this favourable remark, went on. It seems to me, your royal highness, it would greatly endear you to your future people, proving to them that you are nonetheless one of them yourself, despite the misfortune of having been born to a son mother, if you were to commend upon yourself the comparatively slight operation which in the more extended form, you wish to medicate towards your future princess. Ha ha ha, shouted the queen, louder than before, and the king and the minister joined in the laughter. Helip glowered, and for a few moments there, they all continued to express their enjoyment at his discomfort. The queen was the only one Curdy could see in any distinctness. She sat sideways to him, and the light of the fire shone full on her face. He could not have considered her handsome. Her nose was certainly broader at the end than it was at its extreme length, and her eyes, instead of being horizontal, were set up like two perpendicular eggs on the broader side and one on the smaller end. Her mouth was no bigger than a buttonhole, until she laughed, that was, when it stretched from ear to ear, only, to be sure, her ears were rather nearer the middle of her cheek. Anxious to hear what they might say, Cordy ventured to slide down the smooth part of the rock just under him to the projection below it upon which he thought he could rest. But whether he was not quite careful enough or whether the projection gave way, he came rushing down to the floor of the cavern, bringing with him a great rumbling of a shower of stones. The goblins jumped from their seats, more in anger than consternation, 
but they had yet seen nothing in the royal palace to be afraid of. But when they saw Cardi with his pick in hand, their rage was mingled with fear, for they took him to be the first of an invasion of miners. The king, notwithstanding, drew himself up to his full height of four feet, spread himself to his full width of three and a half feet, for he was the handsomest and squarest of all the goblins and strutting up to Curdie, planted himself with outspread feet before him, and said with dignity, Pray, what right have you in my palace? At the right of necessity, your majesty, answered Curdie. I lost my way, and didn't know to where I wandered to. How did you get in? A, a hole in the mountain. But you're a miner. Look at your pickaxe. Cody did indeed look at it, answering, Oh, I came upon this lying on the ground a little way from here. I tumbled over some wild beasts who were playing with it. Look, your majesty. And Curdie showed him how it had been scratched and bitten. The king was pleased to find him behaved more politely than he would have expected from what his people had told him concerning the miners. And he attributed this to the power of his own presence but he did not therefore feel friendly towards the intruder. You will oblige me by walking out of my domain at once, he said, well knowing that what mockery lay in those words. Oh, with pleasure, your majesty, if you will give me a guide, said Curdie. I will give you a thousand, said the king, scoffing with an air of magnificent liberty. Oh, one will be quite sufficient, said Curdie. But the king uttered a strange shout, half a loo, half roar, and in rushed the goblins till the cave was swarming. He said something to the first of them, which Curdie could not hear, and it was passed all around from one till another, till in a moment, even those in the furthest part of the crowd had evidently heard and understood. They began to gather about him in a way he did not relish, and he retreated towards the wall. They pressed upon him. St stand back! cried Curdy, grasping his pickaxe tight. They only grinned and blessed, pressed closer. Curdy bethought himself and began to rhyme. Ten, twenty, thirty, you're all so very dirty. Twenty, thirty, forty, you're all so thick and snorty. Thirty, forty, fifty, you're all so puff and snifty. Forty, fifty, seventy, beasts and man so mi- Forty, fifty, sixty, beast and man so mixty. Fifty, sixty, seventy, mixty, maxty, levity, Se seventy, sixty, eighty, uh, your cheeks are all so slaty, seventy, eighty, ninety, your hands are all so flinty, eighty, ninety, a hundred, a hu together all a dundred. The goblins fell back a little way when he began and made to make horrible grimaces all through the rhyme, as if they were eating something very disagreeable, which set their teeth on edge and gave them cripes. But whether it was that most of the rhyming words were no words at all, for being a new rhyme, for being that a new rhyme was considered most effective, Curdie had begun to make it up on the spur of the moment, or whether it was the presence of the king and queen that gave them courage, I cannot tell. But in the moment the rhyme was over, they all crowded on him again, and out shot hundreds of long arms with a multitude of thick, nailless fingers on the end all trying to lay hold of him. Curdie heaved up his axe. Being as gentle as he was courageous, he had no wish to kill any of them. So he turned the end with the blunt square hammer-like and let it down a great blow on the ne goblin nearest him. Hard as the heads of goblins all are, though, he, he thought it must have felt that. And so it did, no doubt, but it only gave a horrible cry and sprung at Curdie's throat. Curdie, however, drew back and in just the critical moment remembered the vulnerable part of the goblin's body. He made a sudden rush at the king and stamped with all his might on his majesty's royal foot. The king gave an most unkingly howl and almost fell into the fire. Curdy then rushed into the crowd, stamping right and left. The goblins drew back, howling on every side as he approached, but they were so crowded that few of those he attacked could escape his tread. The shrieks and the roars filled the cave, and they would have been most appalling to Curdie, but for the hope that they gave him. 
They were tumbling over each other in heaps in their eagerness to rush from the cave when a new assailant suddenly faced him. The Queen. With flaming eyes and expanded nostrils, her hair standing up from her head, she rushed towards him. She trusted her shoes. They were granite, hollowed out like French sabbats. Curdie would have endured much rather than hurt a woman, even if she was a goblin. But this was a matter of life and death. Forgetting her shoes, he made a great stamp on one of her feet. But she immediately returned it with a very different effect, causing him a frightful pain and almost disabling him. His only chance with her would have been to attack the granite shoes with his pickaxe. But before he could think of that, she had caught him up in her arms and rushed him across the cave. She dashed him into a hole in the wall with such force it almost stunned him. But although he could not move, he was not too far gone to be able to hear the great cry she made or the rush of a multitude of soft feet, followed by the sound of something being heaved up against the rock. After which came a patter of tiny stones falling near him. At last, his senses grew very faint, for he had been cut quite badly on the head, and he became insensible. When he came to himself, there was perfect silence about him, and utter darkness, but for the merest glimmer in one tiny spot. He crawled to it, and found that they had heaved a great slab against the mouth of the hole, past which the edges of a poor glimmer of light had found its way from the fire. He got, could not move it a hair's breadth, for they piled a great heap of stones against it. He crawled back to where he had been lying, hoping in faintly that he might find his pickaxe. But after a vain search, he was at last compelled to acknowledge to himself in an evil plight. He sat down and tried to think, but soon he fell asleep. <laughs>